Amen. You can be seated in the presence of God. Once you get your Bible out and get ready to go to the Word of God, you're joining us online. Good morning. It's so great to worship God with you wherever you are, in your home, in your office, in your bed. It's a little weird for me to think that I'm in your bed right now. I hope you've at least brushed your teeth so far today. But wherever you at, it's uh, an honor to join together and share the Word of God with you. I want to encourage you, if you haven't already shared the link to the stream of the service, do that now, even if you are here in the room. Get your phone out. I know you've probably got it out already. And uh, go to the Connection Church Pikeville Facebook page. Share the stream. There's somebody in your life, one of your Facebook friends, needs to experience the presence of God today, and they are going to need the word uh, that God has planned to be shared here this morning. We are wrapping up today uh, the Sunday morning part of our Reboundology series. I'm going to actually put the final uh, message that I'm going to share with you in first Wednesday, this coming Wednesday. Joe will be hearing more about that uh, in, in the next few hours. Uh, But that's going to be a Zoom call Wednesday night because I want to talk with you. I want to interact with you and have a time of question and answer uh, that we can have some fellowship together. And I also want to share the last reboundology teaching with you Wednesday night. But today is going to conclude the Sunday morning aspect of the series. And uh, I, I know that God has been speaking and changing lives and it's powerful. And I want to talk to you today about rebounding through prayer rebounding through prayer. Part of the legacy of my wife Malia's family was her grandmother, Cora Cooper, in McCrary County, Kentucky. In the year that followed the Great Depression, which was the worst economic downturn in the history of the industrialized world, lasting from 1929 to 1939, Cora's husband died leaving her with five children between the ages of 2 to 13 to raise alone. If you're not familiar with that period of time in our country's history, government aid programs didn't exist yet. Her community and even her own family told her it would be better for her and better for her kids to place them in an orphanage than for her to attempt to raise them on her own and try to hold her family together. The odds that they would survive, that they would have food to eat, that they would have a roof over their heads and avoid some calamity was very bleak. Cora had vision trouble from the time she was a little girl and only reached the eighth grade before it became too difficult for her to read the blackboard. She had these five children with no child care so that she could go to work every day. In order for Cora to rise beyond her circumstances, she needed a miracle. So very simply, she turned to God in prayer. In the back of her house, she prayed, seated on an old tree stump. She prayed in the morning. Sometimes she would return to prayer in the middle of the day, and she came back to pray at night. People would walk by her fence and stop to listen to her dependent prayers, petitions, and requests for God to move. She would worship Him and praise Him. She would sit in silence to hear God speak to her. And He did. And Cora Cooper felt led of God in prayer to run for public office. Think about that. Eighth grade education vision trouble, five small children, and what do you feel led of God to do? Seek public office. So she would take her children to her political speeches held all over the county, line them up beside her as she spoke to the crowd, and she became the first woman elected to public office in McCurry County, Kentucky. In doing so, she met her future husband, who was also an elected official, working across the hall, and they soon started their life together, a legacy 
of deep relationship with Jesus has outlived Korah and lives on in her great-grandchildren to this day. Here's what I want you to take away from that. For Malia's grandmother, prayer revealed the path for her rebound. And I believe it will do the same for you. When you've been knocked down from whatever the situation and circumstance is that has knocked you down, it is very common for us to turn to prayer and it is very appropriate for us to turn to prayer in seeking God's direction for our life. We believe in this church that prayer is so important that next Sunday we are kicking off 21 days of prayer. 21 days of prayer here at Connection Church. And this will be Monday through Fridays for three weeks, beginning at 6.30 a.m. from 6.30 to 7.30 a.m. If you want to join in person, that will be here in the auditorium. And then Saturdays will be 9 a.m. Uh, You can get, if you're here in person, you can get a prayer guide. There will also be downloadable prayer targets that you can get uh, from the church app. We'll have those on social media. So even if you can't be here in person, you can pray along with the daily prayer guides at home or at work or wherever you are and be a part of the 21 days of prayer. How many of you understand something? If there's ever been a moment in the history of our country and in our families' lives where the people of God needed to call on the Lord in prayer, this is that moment. And so the theme of our 21 days of prayer is very simply healing and unity. We need healing in our country. We need healing in our bodies. We need healing in our families. And we need unity to be embraced and to be walked out in the body of Christ. Our nation needs healed. Our family needs healed. Our bodies need healed. And that's not going to come from government. It's not going to come from business. It's going to come from the body of Christ. So I'm challenging you to, in whatever way, shape, and form, plan on it throughout the rest of this week that's come next Sunday. I'm going to be part of 21 days of prayer. If you can't be a part of all 21 days of prayer, you can only be a part of one day, be part of one day. But do what you can do and sacrifice a little bit of sleep, sacrifice breakfast time, and you will not regret, you will not regret investing time in seeking the Lord. It's going to be a powerful time together. If prayer is critical to your rebound, then we need to know what prayer is and how to pray. What I'm going to share with you today, specifically, is a question that I know many people wrestle with from time to time. And and, and no doubt some of you have even had this question on your heart over the last few days. Somebody that's in church online, church at home right now, has wrestled with this question, why wasn't my prayer answered? Why does it feel like God is not answering my prayer? Why does it feel like that there is a low ceiling on my prayers? You're you're saying, I I think I'm saying the right words. I think I've got the magic formula when it comes to what I'm praying, but it feels like that my prayers aren't being answered. Prayer is simply communicating with God. Communicating with God. How many of you have ever been in a conversation with somebody, and I'm going to put air quotes and do my Chris Farley impersonation. You've been in a conversation with somebody, and, you know, conversation, the word conversation evokes dialogue that there is speaking and listening. And you're supposed to be in a conversation with somebody, but really all it was for you was a listening exercise. They did all the talking and you did all the listening. And then maybe they walk away and say, hey, thanks for the awesome conversation. That wasn't a conversation. That was ear abuse. (laughs) Anybody know what I'm talking about? That you're supposed to be talking to somebody and you have to walk away and go find a dark, quiet room and sit alone for a while and let your ears heal up from the verbal abuse that you were just subjected to. Nobody enjoys that. And you know what? God doesn't either. That's not prayer. But that's what a lot of us think prayer is. 
is just throwing up my wish list to God and I'm just saying words to God and I call it prayer. We don't enjoy those kind of, quote, conversations. And, and God doesn't either. Now listen, God wants to hear from you and that's better than nothing, but that's not where you'll find the fulfillment of prayer. Because prayer is conversation. Prayer is dialogue, not monologue. That means that real prayer is a time of you talking to God, and, and here's what we miss, the second part of it, make you making space for God to talk to you. What revolutionized Cora Cooper's family tree was not what she said to God, but what God said to her. And so what you and I must learn is not so much what I need to say to God, although that's important, but how we are living our life in such a way that God can say something to you that will change your life. And that's what I want to create an appetite for you today and challenge you to take some action steps this morning, moving you toward a deeper life of prayer. Proverbs chapter 13 verse number 12 says, hope deferred makes the heart grow sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. The word longing in some versions is translated desire. Desire. Something that you want, when it is deferred, it literally makes you sick. But when you see that realized, when you see desire realized, it is a tree of life. That's actually talking about answered prayer. Answered prayer is a tree of of life for you. The tree of life is talked about in three different places in the Bible. The tree of life past was in the Garden of Eden. The tree of life future, the book of Revelation says, is in heaven. But there's a tree of life present. There is a current tree of life that you and I can access right now. And according to the verse that we've just read, the current present tree of life is answered prayer. That just in the same way in the, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve could eat of the tree of life and live forever and experience the goodness of God. And in the New Testament, in the book of Revelation, the Bible says that in heaven that we can eat from the tree of life and the leaves of which are for the healing of the nations. The tree of life present, which is answered prayer, that when we move into a place of answered prayer, that that is you and I feeding ourselves from the goodness of God. That as you and I, feeding and drawing strength, we can feed our soul and say, God is a good God. He is faithful to His Word. I've looked all over, I've searched all over, and there is none like to the Lord. Friend, one of the reasons why you need to know and you need to remove the things that may be hindering your prayer is that you don't have to wait to get to heaven to feed from the tree of life. You can feed from the tree of life right now, and that when you're going through a pandemic, when you're going through layoff, when you're waiting on your unemployment, when you don't know which way is up, you can feed from the tree of life and say, you know what, I remember a time when I didn't know what to do and God heard my prayer and He gave me direction and if He was good then, He will be good now. Amen. Amen. Why is this so important? Because when we feel like our prayers aren't being answered, when there's no tree of life presently in our life, and we feel like our prayers aren't being heard, our prayers aren't being answered, here's what we tend to do. Quit praying. Why would I pray if I feel like my prayers aren't answered? And we start to look at other people and we say, well, God hears their prayer, but He don't hear my prayer. God loves them more than He loves me. They are prayer ninjas. They have a black belt in prayer. I haven't even gotten down to the kindergarten of prayer. And so we just stop praying. And I want to tell you today, that's the, worst, that's the last thing you need to do. Right. What we must do is recognize and remove the things that hinder our prayers. And you don't have to hunt and peck as to what it might be 
that's hindering your prayer. The Bible's very clear about some things that hinder your prayer. And so what I want to share with you over the next few moments quickly today is five things that matter to God when you pray. Five things that matter to God when you pray. And I want you to listen today, and I want you to hear this, uh, not in the sense, you know, sometimes we hear a message, we'll hear a sermon and say, man, I wish so-and-so was here to hear this. If you've never done that, I'll confess and say, I do that all the time. In fact, sometimes I do that about y'all. I'll get your face right here in my mind. Like, Ooh, man. But I do it in love, so that's okay. But this is really important. As I'm sharing with you what God gave me to give to you, don't, don't go through your list and say, man, I wish my husband was here, you know, because Uch and Al, they really need this. No, 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 this is for you. God has got you in the right place, right there in your living room, in your bedroom, as you're listening to this, driving down the road, wherever you're at, you're sitting at the beach, you're enjoying uh, back-to-school shopping, tax-free weekend in Tennessee, which, by the way, you spent more money in gas, food, and hotel than what you're going to save in your tax savings. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> Wherever you're at, God has planned for this word to be for you. For you. Five things that matter to God when you pray. First thing is this. You need to know that when you pray, your relationships matter to God. Your relationships matter to God. Mark chapter 11, verse number 24, and, and you don't have to try and write all this down. We have all these notes on the app for you. You can go to the church app and find all these notes and, and have all that, and we'll have it all on the screen for you. There's going to be a bunch of scripture today. Mark eleven twenty four. 24, Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. How many of those powerful statements? And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them. So that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. Jesus is talking about mountain, mountains being moved. He's talking about moving mountains with faith and prayer. And he says these bold statements. He says, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. But he can't say that without also saying, oh, by the way, while you're praying those faith-filled, mountain-moving prayers, God's going to check your heart on your relationships. And you can pray the most faith-filled, mountain-moving prayers that you know how to pray. And you can read every book on faith. You can, uh, you can get every Kenneth Hagin book and cassette tape. Y'all remember cassette tapes? Or as they pronounce them, cassette tapes. You can get every cassette tape, every CD, every YouTube video, every podcast on faith. Quote it forwards and backwards and feel like you've got all the faith in the world to move a mountain. But if your heart is full of unforgiveness... Your mountain's going to stay. Your mountain's going to stay. He says, when you stand praying, if you recognize you hold anything against anyone, if there's unforgiveness in your heart, forgive them. Why? Because your prayer's going to be hindered. Your prayer is going to be hindered. Jesus is saying to us that our relationships affect our prayers. Our relationships affect our prayers. He reveals that how we interact with people affects how we interact with God. Do you understand that? How you interact with people, how you go to work and interact with people, how you interact with people at home, how you interact with strangers, how you interact with your family, how you interact with your coworkers, how you do life with people, your interactions with people affects how you interact with God. And by the way, let me say this, if you are truly interacting with God, it will show up in how you interact with people. That was a weak amen. If you're truly interacting with God, it will show up in how you interact with people. Here's what you need to know. God loves you and the other person too much to allow there to be 
a bitterness and a grudge and an unforgiveness in your heart and the Holy Spirit not get in the middle of it. And it don't matter how big your mountain is that you want to be moved. It don't matter how long that mountain's been there. It don't matter how much urgency that you have to see that mountain moved and cast into the sea. And it don't matter how much faith you have in your heart to see that mountain move. When you go into prayer and you begin to speak faith and you cast that mountain in the sea and you speak to the mountain and you're doing everything that you know to do and you're praying in tongues, you're praying in the spirit, you're pacing the floor, you're laying face down before God, you're fasting, you're doing everything you you know to do. When you're in prayer, the the Holy Ghost is going to speak to you and say, yeah, but you need to Forgive Bob. Because your mountain ain't moving until you deal with the mountain in your heart. Y'all are quiet already. This is going to be awesome. God says, I'm not moving the mountain in your life till you deal with the mountain in your heart. And so your relationships matter to God when you pray. Here's another uncomfortable scripture for you. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 7. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you in the gracious gift of life. Why? So that nothing will hinder your prayers. Wow. If I gave you an eraser... To erase a line out of the Bible. I said, fellas, you got, you got one whack at it. You got one, you got, the, God's given you this gift. You've got one verse that you can remove from all of Scripture. There's a lot of guys that say, <laughs> give me 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Now think about this. This is how powerful it is. There's a big relationship that God cares about in a big way. And if it's not right, it can hinder our prayer in a big way. And God puts this on husbands. He says, husbands, if we're dishonoring our wives, if we are dishonoring, it doesn't say if you're arguing, it doesn't say if you disagree. He says if you dishonor. If you dishonor. If you're dishonoring your wives, there is a spiritual consequence to that, and it's that the heavens become brass over your prayers. The word hinder here is the Greek word ekopto, and it doesn't mean delay. Ekopto means to cut off. So here's what God's saying, that when you are dishonoring to your spouse, it doesn't delay your prayers, it denies your prayers. It doesn't slow down the breakthrough. It eliminates the breakthrough. So here's what what I want you to think about. If you're married, if you're married, look right here. Here's what I want you to think about. I I I want you to go in deep thought about this. Which one of your prayers can you afford to have cut off? I don't know about you, but I don't have one. There's not one thing that I'm praying, that I'm praying for, that I can say, you know what, I can live without that one. Not any of the prayers for my children, not any of the prayers for other family members, not any of the prayers for our church, not any of the prayers for my health, not any of the prayers for finances, not any of the prayers for our country. There's not one thing that, I, that matters to me enough about that I go to God in prayer that I can say it would be acceptable if God cuts that one off. Your relationships matter to God when it comes to your prayer. Here's the second thing that matters to God. Your motives matter. Your motives matter. Proverbs chapter 16, verse number 2 says, All a person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. We think everything that we're doing is pure and right. We are pure in our own eyes. But God says, I'm not looking at your actions, I'm looking at your motives. I'm not so much looking and listening to the words that you're praying, I'm weighing out why you're praying it. 
Your motives matter. James chapter 4, verse number 3 says, When you ask, talking about prayer, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. And James chapter 4 here in this passage is talking specifically about you praying for finances. And here's the reveal of that. You ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. He said the whole reason some of you are praying for God to bless you with money is because you've got spending on your mind, not giving on your mind. You've got self on your mind, not others on your mind. You've got your kingdom on your mind, not God's kingdom on your mind. So your prayer is bless me, bless me, bless me, so that I can bless me, bless me, bless me. Rather than the Abrahamic covenant, which is I will bless you so that you may bless others. So he says one of the reasons why your prayers are not advancing is because your motive is wrong. God evaluates the motive behind the prayer. It's not just the words, it's the why. And so I don't, I, I don't always know my heart, but God knows my heart. The Word of God says that the heart of man is utterly wicked and deceitful. Who can know it? You don't even know your heart. How can you follow your heart when you don't know your heart? That's why I have to live in in relationship with the Lord for Him to purify my heart. So my motives matter. Here's what God's Word is telling us. Wrong motives equals rejected prayers. You can have the right words with the wrong motives and that will become rejected prayers. Can y'all handle this? Here's the third thing. Boy, if you struggled at the first two. Here's the third thing that matters to God when you pray. The way you live. The way you live matters to God. James chapter 5, 16 says, The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Not the prayer of a person. Not the prayer of a church-going person. Not the prayer of someone that puts Christian memes on their Facebook. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Proverbs chapter 15, 29 says, The Lord is far from the wicked, but He hears the prayer of the righteous. Now, here's what we don't want to hear in 2020. Here's what we don't want to hear. Living in perpetual sin silences my prayers to God. Y'all don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. My flesh don't want to hear that. You want to hear eight weeks on just grace. You need to know that living in cognizant, chosen, disobedience silences your prayers willful disobedience silences your prayers sin is a prayer killer but prayer is a sin killer I'm going to say that again for those that may not have heard it in any of the corners of the building sin is a prayer killer But prayer is a sin killer. Galatians chapter 6 verse 8 says, The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. But the one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. If I sow my life, if I keep sowing my actions and my choices to just do what I feel like doing, Dusty was talking about gardening and vegetables. and I don't know about you, but I was getting hungry. <laughs> Nothing like good garden cucumbers. And you sow those seeds and you protect them, you sure enough going to get a harvest. And the Word of God says, when you willfully sow disobedience and sin into your life day after day after day after day, there will come a harvest and you will not like it. And part of that harvest is our prayers do not get answered. Letting sin linger in your life is choosing to slam the door shut on your prayers. 
So again, which one of your prayers can you afford to have the door slam shut? Here's the fourth thing that matters to God when you pray. Your faith matters. Your faith matters. James chapter 1 verse number 6 says, But when he asks, he must believe. Everybody shout believe. believe. Type believe in the, in the chat box watching online. He must believe and not doubt. Because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. Again, strong words. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. I believe the King James says it like this. Don't let that man think he'll receive anything from the Lord. So that means that James that wrote this was the half-brother of Jesus. Same mom, different dad. Some of y'all are going to take a while to figure that one out. <laughs> and he was the pastor of the church of Jerusalem. Not only was James the pastor of the church of Jerusalem that grew to like 30,000 people, but he was all of the other apostles' pastor. And here's what James says, that as a pastor, it is my responsibility to look you in the eye and say, if you're going to live a life of doubt, do not expect to receive anything from God in prayer. Well, how do I pray in faith then? What does that look like? Here, here, here's the most basic and helpful thing that I, can, that I can tell you today. For most of us, we don't need to increase our faith. We need to eliminate our doubt. I would say for virtually every person that is here today, that is watching and listening online, you're listening to this podcast while you're driving down the road, you don't need more faith. You just need to eliminate doubt in your life. If you could starve out your doubt, your faith that you have, whether it be small or great, would stand strong. If you could starve out your doubt, all you need is faith the size of a mustard seed, and it'll move that mountain that's in your life. But when you have doubt, the doubt cancels out your faith. How do I eliminate doubt out of my life, Pastor Rich? That is a great question. I'm so glad that you asked it. Doubt is dealt with through teaching. The fundamental teaching of the Word of God, the elementary teaching of the Word of God, the thus saith the Lord, line upon line, precept upon precept, the teaching of God's Word will deal with your doubt. One of the reasons why we have doubt growing in our mind is because we are distant from the Word of God. If all you have is an emotional experience at church without the grounding of the Word of God, you will be like the waves of the sea. I'm up today because I felt something at church, and I'm down on Tuesday because I don't know the Word of God. Teaching deals with your doubt. That is one of the great reasons why you need to be in a connect group when they come back open again here in a few weeks is get in a connect group so you can be taught the Word of God, you can get grounded in the Word of God, and the doubt can be starved out and faith can begin to grow so that when you have a mountain standing in front of you, and how many of you got a mountain in your life right now? If you're watching a church at home right now and you say, I got a mountain, just type, I got a mountain. When you've got a mountain in your life, you have been taught the Word of God and you're not living according to your emotions or your feelings, but you are standing on the Word of God and it doesn't matter if it's Sunday morning and you don't feel saved or you don't feel the presence of God because you're not in a room full of people or you're not hearing your favorite song. You can be in the middle of a crisis on a Friday, but you know the Word of God to be true and you can stand and face your mountain and speak the Word of God with even just a little bit of faith in your heart, but no doubt. No doubt. God says faithless prayers are unanswered prayers. Faithless prayers are unanswered prayers. He says a wave of the sea blossed, blown and tossed by the wind. If we're going to rebound through prayer, then we can't allow the changing winds of our circumstances to toss us around. If you're going to really rebound through prayer, you can't be tossed up and down based on what the news report says. Well, I feel like God's going to move. And then tomorrow, Lord, you see what was on the news. I really feel like God's going to do something in my life. And then you get a text message. Where is God? No. 
If you're going to rebound through prayer, it means that I'm not tossed up and down, back and forth, believe God, don't believe God. I pray a faith-filled prayer and then walk away, wring my hands, Lord, I don't know. I don't have to have great faith. I just need to starve out my doubt. And here's the last thing I'm going to share with you today. What matters to God when you pray? God's will matters. God's will matters. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 says, Since we have this confidence, everybody shout confidence. We can also have great boldness before Him. You see, confidence equals boldness. Because we have this confidence, we can also have great boldness before Him. For if we ask anything agreeable to His will, He will hear us. And if we know that He hears us in whatever we ask, we also know that we have obtained the requests we ask of Him. Confidence equals boldness. Not necessarily boldness with people, but the boldness that matters is boldness with God in prayer. Did you know? That you have been given, you have been given access to pray boldly. Now think about that. Not uncertainly, not timidly, not like the cowardly lion approaching the Wizard of Oz, but to pray boldly. How can I pray boldly? Here's the secret. We know that He will hear us in whatever we ask, if we ask anything agreeable to His will. The key to bold prayers is praying in agreement with God's will. I can be confident and bold in prayer if I'm praying according to God's will. Now, let me clarify this. This doesn't mean that I start my prayer and say, God, if it be your will. Or that I conclude my prayer and say, if it be your will. That's not what this verse means. Now, there's a whole lot of Christians that think that that's what that means. That's not what that means. Here's what it means. It means, here's the confidence that gives us boldness to pray to God. Here's what it means. It means that we seek out and know God's will before we pray. And that before I ever pray the first word, I know that I'm praying according to God's will. That I don't just pray whatever I feel like praying and then sandwich it in between if it be your will. No, 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 no. It means that I learn God's will and then I pray into God's will. And so here's the million dollar question that everybody's got on their mind. But pastor, how can I know God's will? And here's the truth. It's why you came to church today. God's will is revealed in God's word. I can't know God's will if I don't know God's word. Why do you think the devil's trying to keep you distracted from the Word of God? So you don't know the will of God. And if I don't know the will of God, I can't pray confidently. And if I don't pray confidently, I'm praying in doubt. And if I'm praying in doubt, the book says, I will not receive. And when I live a life of prayer that doesn't receive, I end up not living a life of prayer. Let me wrap it all up and give you this. Jesus said, when you pray, pray like this. Matthew 6.10, Jesus said, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So here's the question I want you to think about today. Here's, Here's the question I want to haunt you. Here's the question I want you to wrestle with. Jesus said, on earth as it is in heaven. Here's the question. How is it in heaven? Because that's the heart of God. However it is in heaven, let it be like that on earth. I didn't make it up. I don't have a trick Bible. 
however it is in heaven. So if you're wondering, what is God's will? How is it in heaven? Friend, it's God's will that everyone in your family be saved. Very simple. It's God's will that everyone in your family be saved. I don't have to find out, God, is it your will that my son be saved? No, I know that it's, my will, it's God's will that my house shall be saved. There's a connect card in front of you. A connect card around you. A connect card beside you. Here's what I want you to do. Grab it. Get an ink pen. You should turn it over somewhere. This is not going to be for anybody else's benefit. This is just totally for you. And I want you to think, in the last seconds we have together today, what's the one roadblock in your prayer life that you need to remove and lay down? I've shared five of them with you today. All of us have at least one. What's one roadblock to your prayers that you need to remove and lay it down? I want you to write it down. You can write it down on the prayer request part. You can write it down on the name. Nobody's going to see this. You're just confessing this before God. Write it down and then lay it down. Just leave it on the seat around you. Just lay it, write it down and lay it down. You that are watching at church at home, if you want to type it out, you can do that. If you want to type it into your phone and, and just keep it between you and God, if you want to send it as a private message to the church for accountability and somebody to pray with you, whatever format, whatever outlet, just do it. Just get that out and say, I got to get this out of my prayer life because there's not one prayer I'm praying that I can afford for it to be hindered. And I got to get this out of my life. Stand with me today across the house of God. Father God, we're so thankful that you love us enough that you want to hear from us, that you want to talk to us, that you have things to say to us. Thank you that you've given us your word, that we can understand prayer, that we can grow in prayer, that we can remove hindrances to prayer in our life, that we can rebound in prayer. Whatever's knocked us down, for all of us, the key to our breakthrough is to begin to really seek God in prayer. And we thank you for that, Lord. I pray for every person today that is going to another level in you and your plans and communicating with you today. God, that we be people of prayer as we position our hearts for 21 days of prayer coming up in this church. That it be something that we all participate in. In whatever way, shape, or form that we all have a time of focused prayer. Thank you, Lord. Continue praying and seeking God. Listen, friend, the most important prayer that you will pray is the pray where, prayer where you give your life to Christ. The Bible says those that are far from God, and maybe that's you, you know that in your heart of hearts that you are far from God. And friend, you don't have to be. You can go home today. You can go back about your day knowing that you are no longer far from Him, but you are in His hand. And you confess sin and you confess Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life. And I want to give you that opportunity right now, wherever you are, if you're in the room or you're online, and you say, today is the day that I no longer want to be far from God, but today is the day I want to come home to Him. That I don't want to hope that I'm right with God. I don't want to think and believe that maybe I'm right with God. I want to know that there's no sin that would separate us. There's no strongholds. There's nothing that would stand between me and God. No space and no distance. Today's the day for you to come home to Him. If you're ready right now to give your life to Christ and you're watching or listening online, I want you to text LIFE to the number on the screen. If you're here in this room and you say, right now's the moment, today's the day, I'm ready to give my life to Jesus. And know that I know beyond the shadow of a doubt that heaven will be my home and hell will be shunned. I want you to shoot your hand up in the air straight to God right now as a sign and acknowledgement to Him. Jesus, I'm giving my life to you today. God bless you in the back. Praise God. Praise God. Somebody else, this is your moment right now. Today is the day. This is the destiny moment for me as I give my life to Christ. Church, can we all pray this prayer together with our new brother in Christ? Lord Jesus, thank you for choosing me. Today I choose you. Sin, you're no longer my master. I'm no longer in control. Jesus, wash me clean. Be my Lord. Be my friend. Teach me how to live for you. 
Fill me today with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give God one more big hand clap of praise today as you can be seated.